Ja, han kan. Ja, ja han, han, han sidder fint. Ja, det er fint. Jeg nævnte.
we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you as well. Uh, I think I'm visible. So, oh, I, I can see Dinas now, right? Okay, super. Okay, say hello to Dinas or give him a mic if you like. Yes. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Dinas. This is me. Just say hello to you if you can hear me. I oh. hope you can. When I was first introduced to you, your name was Andre Talecki. And you mean it changed it? Can you remember? No. Because, because the 2.2 members couldn't pronounce Talecki. <laughs> they, they quickly learned. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> as you are concerned. Good to see you. Sorry I couldn't be there, but let's go. Okay, so everything is fine. Hello, I get the microphone here. Hello, Andre. Hi, 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 so I'm the chairman of the committee, and I'll just, uh, you know, in a little while explain what is going, what is going to go on. But uh, I think we are, we are all set. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. This is Anna Hackshausen. Oh, hello. Hi. hi. How are you? Oh, well, I'm waiting for all the smell. It's difficult to recognize people in yeah. these masks. Yeah. Hi. Where's the camera? So, Andre, do you see me? No, I'm just uh, talking to Andre. Hi. Andre, hi, Andre. Oh, yeah, okay. You see me, okay. Well, yeah, I can see you. I can see. I think I can see the back of the of the head of Fleming, and uh, yeah. I can't see. No, no, Patrick. it's who who. I can't see Patrick anyway, but he's probably. Oh yeah, yeah. I just off the screen, Patrick. <laughs> I've seen your hand waving, but. <laughs> Jeg har jo ikke måttet kommunikere med dig i over et år. Så kan jeg ikke se jer. Sæt jer der.
Welcome. Now, before we get started, uh, I'd like briefly to inform about DTU's guideline for reducing, for reducing the spread of coronavirus. DTU is open, but we must limit the infection with coronavirus as much as possible. Therefore, DTU follows the recommendation of the authorities, and the main rules are that distance should be kept at all times, that hands are frequently sanitized or washed, and if you have a suspicion that you are infected, that you leave the campus immediately. Also, face masks, masks are worn in hallways, etc., but can be removed when sitting in the auditorium. We do, of course, all this in order to protect each other and to avoid compromising the safety in our society. Now, if someone stands a little too close to you or forgets to sanitize, and that can happen, it's okay to uh, say it with a smile and receive it with a smile. Now, with that said, we can uh, get started. I would like to welcome everybody to this doctoral thesis defense. And I would especially like to welcome the doctoral candidate, Professor Emeritus Dines Bjorno, and the two official opponents, Professor Andrei Taleski from the Institute of Informatics in, at the University of Warsaw, and Professor Patrick Blackburn from the Department of Communication and Arts at the University of Roskilde. Also a welcome to Professor Fleming Nilsson from the Department of Applied Mathematics and Computer Science at our own university. He is the chairman of the uh, assessment committee. My name is Rasmus Larsen. I'm the university provost and chief ac academic officer, and I'll be the chairman of the proceedings today. The doctoral thesis that we are concerned with today is entitled Domain Science and Engineering, a Foundation for Software Development, and it was handed in to the university on September 6, 2019. Thereafter, uh, an assessment committee was appointed in March 2020, and following the assessment committee's positive assessment, the doctoral thesis was accepted, by, was accepted for defense by the Academic Council on September 22nd, 2020. Let me just briefly outline uh, the proceedings of this afternoon. So after my small introduction, the, the uh, doctoral candidate will present his thesis in a lecture of approximately 30 minutes. And thereafter, I'll give the word to the official opponents who will discuss the thesis with the candidate. After that, there is the opportunity to ask question to the, questions to the thesis ex auditorio. So I have not been notified of any unofficial opponents ex auditorio in beforehand. If there are any who would like to ask questions from the auditorium, you should register with me in the short break we have immediately after the lecture and before the first opponent. The first official opponent, Andrei Taleski, will participate or is participating online, as you can all see. And the doctoral defense will be live streamed, is being live streamed, and will be recorded for documentation for the benefit of those that are not able to attend today. When uh, the discussion with the opponents has finished, the defense is over and DTU will host a small reception in uh, the faculty club just next to the uh, auditorium. Now, on the occasion of a doctoral defense at DTU in 2020, it's impossible not to mention that 2020 
is a year of celebration in our university. A year of celebration because it's the bicentennial for Hans Christian Ørsted's discovery of electromagnetism. We have at DTU led a national dissemination initiative with many partners celebrating the curiosity-driven scientist and the impact of science through engineering and industrial ingenuity on our society. And I, uh, on this occasion, would also like to mention that Friday last week, as part of the celebrations, Professor Charlie Marcus from the University of Copenhagen received the Hans Christian Ørsted Gold Medal in Physics from the Society for the Dissem Dissemination of Natural Science. The gold medal was presented to Professor Marcus by Her Majesty the Queen, and in his speech at the event, Professor Marcus characterized Ørsted's discovery as one of the only three big ideas in physics in the past 200 years. This idea was namely the idea of unification of the understanding of the things we can observe, the other two being uh, that we only see a projection of the natural forces onto our physical world, an idea that's attributed to Niels Bohr, another Dane. The third big idea being emergence, namely that the collective behavior is qualitatively different from the individual constituents of particles in physics. And the interesting thing here is, of course, that two of these ideas came out of uh, Denmark. Yeah. Now, Ørsted was uh, uh, of course important for this university in that it was on his initiative that the university was founded with an inspiration from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And Ørsted himself defended his doctoral thesis, not at this university, but at his alma mater, University of Copenhagen, in 1799. So uh, there's a big history be behind defending a doctoral thesis as a scientist in the, this uh, university, linking all the way uh, back uh, to Ørsted. And with this, I'd like to invite Dinis Fjörner to take the podium and present his work on domain science and engineering, a foundation for software development. Please go ahead, Dinis. Thank you very much. Uh, I, will, I have taken the podium for the last hour or so. I will take the liberty of remaining seated. Uh, I'm not uh, strong enough to stand up uh, physically, but I am strong enough to stand up for critique, we will hear and see. So yes, you will not be exposed to any new great ideas of the physics world, uh, but perhaps you will be exposed to some interesting uh, ideas. The realm of our work is that sprang from that of software. And you can read yourself what it says on the screen. Uh, so I will not uh, read up for you. But the idea is that in the past, in the 50s, 1950s and 1960s, people were concerned with writing programs for computers, what we call software. So software design was software engineering. A high point of that were the proof rules of Hall Logic, 1969, same year as the conference was held on uh, software engineering in Markdorferdorf in Germany, where some of the initial ideas that had been around but were certainly solidified arose, namely those of requirements engineering. It took some years 
and it is still going on. Uh, I became my I began my interest in a predecessor for that. Already, you could say, in 1973, when I joined the IBM uh, laboratory in Vienna, Austria, where we were to develop a compiler for a new series of IBM machines for the then standard IBM language called PL1. And of course, being in Vienna, being steeped in uh, philosophical logic and so on, uh, we adhered to the idea that first we must understand the semantics of the programming language PL1. So we sat down to write down uh, for the third time in the history of that laboratory, uh, a semantics, the previous ones had been so-called operational. Uh, this one in the years 73 to 74 took form of basically being a denotational semantics according to Dana Scott and Christopher Strachey. Domain engineering for compilers is basically one aspect is that of writing down the semantics of the programming language for which they translate and or interpret. There are other aspects, other domain engineering, namely how the user uses the language and so on. We shall not come into that. I took up this uh, when in the years 19 in 92 to 97, I was UN director of the UN Universities Institute in Macau. And the half the projects in Macau were software engineering oriented. And the other half were theory foundation oriented. And we pursued domain engineering with the backing of the scientific foundations laid down by our colleague groups for various application areas. And when I retired, I had time to write it all down. And I did so uh, over the following years. But one can study domains without necessarily aiming at software. Just as we study physics without necessarily aiming at engineering uses. Over the years, so the, the thesis itself is based on a number of publications in the last uh, uh, 12 years. Uh, I have reordered them according to their structure in the thesis. Uh, and the core is what I will cover today, is chapter one in the thesis. Uh, and I will not cover the others, but certainly I will entertain and discuss uh, and debate uh, questions concerning all of the chapters. So what is a domain? We have to understand that the thing we are talking about in some sense is necessarily informal. It would be nice for all of us, my opponents, my colleagues here, if it was not so, then we could write down neat, beautiful mathematical definitions and, and uh, be held responsible for that. So here is a, my attempt of a definition. It has been honed over the years, but so far it seems applicable. I have emphasized some of the words in blue, so it's rationally describable. We'll come back to what I mean by that. So based on philosophical logic and so on, rationally describable. It is primarily um, covering the, a world of discrete dynamics, but borders into and overlaps with uh, more continuous domains, time continuous. And more importantly, it is that segment of the world which 
is human assisted, which focuses on the artifacts that we as humans have created, uh, the physical artifacts, the, the materials, the artifactual ones, but it covers the broader area as you can see there. Over the years, I have applied this to many different uh, domains. And there's a list here, a reverse chronological. It started in the 90s with railways, and the most recent one is a sizable uh, presentation of a domain description for uh, container terminals done with students at East China Normal University in Shanghai uh, a little more than a year ago. But you can see there's a rather diverse uh, spectrum of applications. Some of them may not quite be of the kind of the domain kind that I have tried to define for example, the web-based transaction processing. But with some leeway, we could claim so. So there is a science and engineering of analysis and description, I say. I claim, how do the domain scientists co-engineer that person who is both being a scientist while doing it, but also being an engineer in doing it? How does she proceed? How do they go about describing a domain? First, by analyzing it according to a number of principles, using some techniques and tools. We learn no normally at this university uh, and others about theories of physics already in middle school and high school before we can learn to do physics, that is, to create new physics. In this study, uh, I claim that we can learn how to create new domain theories. We can learn, for example, from Carl von Linné 250 years ago. You have all been able to take one of these beautiful flowers, peel, uh, leaf by leaf of the flower bud off and through successive questions of a binary nature come up to which kingdom it belongs to at the, at the top and which species it is at the bottom. Very similarly uh, we shall proceed but not quite. I claim that there is a philosoph philosophy basis there is certainly a mathematical basis, indispensably so. And here I quote from Kaiser Lander, the basic question that confronts us in domain description is one, two or three. What, if anything, is of such necessity that it can under no circumstances be otherwise? That is, which are the necessary properties of any possible world? That is, which mutually defined basic concept must be assumed in every possible world description? Kaiser Landa suggests, on the basis of the possibility of truth, be careful, possibility of truth, rather than Immanuel Kant's basis of self-awareness that in assertions, and that's of course what we write down, we keep writing down assertions about the world we are describing, the domain. There are mutual dependencies between the meaning of designations, what does a term stand for, and consistency relation between these assertions. Now, a classical algebraic semanticist like Professor Talitsky uh, would love this because that's exactly uh, how a basis for algebraic semantics that we uh, identify the 
the entities and the operations upon them and express the properties by the mutual dependencies between all these. Also, it follows from rational reasoning that there is more than one entity in the world to be described. So, I will now go into a description uh, covering uh, chapter one. And it would be a tour de force. Uh, there's no way uh, you will be able to uh, afterwards be examined in this and pass the exam, nor even do what I prescribe. But we start by uh, basically at the top of the of the diagram there, at the root. We start by asking which are the things that we can observe that I can describe and which are not describable. Those that are describable I will call entities. So the blue name is entity is now a prompt in German Stichwort, in English a cube or a prompt. that the domain describer, the analyzer comp describer, um, applies to whatever is being observed. Are you an entity or not? And if so, let us go on. So we have covered that upper uh, right uh, rounded area there briefly. Now, I decide it is not based on a philosophical uh, explanation, but I decide to um, divide the entities that I can observe into either endurance or perdurance. So, ladies and gentlemen, one thing you can go home with this afternoon is two new words in your vocabulary, endurant and perdurant. And I hope they will haunt you tonight and you will wake up. And what was it he said so cleverly? So endurance, the chair I'm sitting in, this microphone here, this, this, uh, this uh, remote control, the tables you're sitting at are endurance. The whole room here is an endurance. The whole building is an endurance, obviously. Um, so the perdurance, uh -huh, we'll see what that is. Perhaps the proceedings of this afternoon is a perdurance. So we've covered that part. Now we can distinguish between discrete and continuous endurance. And ladies and gentlemen, continue Continuity, in this context, is not related to time. It is related, you could say, to form. Most of what you see here are discrete, but the content of this mineral water bottle, the content which I wish I could have poured into a glass, uh, is continuous. And we are down in this part of the world now. From endurance, from the discrete ones, I decide to be analyze them into either physical parts or living species, and that, there I follow, you could say, Kaiser philosophy, or when I wish to be less specific, uh, typically about physical parts, I call them structure. And I cover more and more. Physical part is either natural or artifactual. So there are these two. And we can mostly be concerned with the natural, with the artifactual, the man-made. And those I further analyze into atomic or composite parts, 
and set parts which are also composite, but in a simpler sense. And we have reached the bottom. So we have introduced uh, some aspects of a calculus of domain analysis. The, the prompts are listed here in blue, uh, and they are analysis prompts, and they are informal, being applied to an informal world, but they give a formal answer, yes or no, true or false. And those that are marked uh, with a square, uh, colored square, you find them in, in the diagram there, lead to our being able to also now make descriptions. Descriptions of composite parts, set parts, materials, structures. So we go from analysis to description now. Here is a typical description function, a more generic one. It says, describe sorts of type P and we give some text on the sorts, on the types of the entities where we are observing. Uh, we give some text on how we observe them. Interesting. And importantly, uh, on the invariance of this. Narrative form and in a formal form. And you don't have to spend much time on that. Here, however, is an example of how a domain description at the top level of a railway system may look like. So to the, to the, to the left on the screen, the railway system with its railway units at the bottom, uh, and to the right, the trains. First, narratively, informally, and then formally. Just because I write down these names uh, is not enough. Far from. The, the meaning of these terms could be anything. At this moment, at the front, when you read this page, the meaning of it could be anything. So we need to give more and more and more details before we hopefully can settle that that is what a railway is from our point of view. So there is a description calculus. Describe composite, describe concrete, and so on. And as before, they are informal. You apply them and they result in narrative and informal text. Now we come to what really gives blood and flesh uh, to the entities to the endurance, namely that they are unique, that they possess a meteorology, and that they have attributes. So that's why I have shown these vertical lines emanating from the leaf nodes of the tree diagram down to the horizontal lines. Unique identify. Here we claim that all parts, atomic, composite, and set, are uniquely identifiable. This itself is an interesting philosophical issue. Identity. So we have a way of describing them, text on unique identifiers, their type possible values, axioms about them. Do not underestimate the, the axioms. That's where it all gets to hang together. Trivially for our case of railways, this is not in honor of one of our opponents. It is in honor of Stanisław Lesniewski, Polish, logician, philosopher, mathematician. The pictures to the right is a statue of Stanislaw Lesniewski. And he is also to the right in the left picture 
where you also can see Tarski and Lukasiewicz and then some person whose name I know but says me nothing. This is the of, of, of the Academy of, of Polish Academy of Science. So mediality is the study and knowledge of parts and part relations. These tables, each, if I consider each of these that you sit at as an entity, then its relation, its mediality, a relation to the table next to it is that it is next to it. It is to the right or to the left of it. The row you are sitting at has a mariality that is in front of some of the other rows, that it has a row in front of it or no, and it has a row or no row in the back of it. So that's part of the you could say the physically, physical mirrorology. Conceptual, there could be others, like in an automobile. Automobiles could be members of an automobile club, uh, your membership, or registered in the Department of Vehicles. Or they could relate otherwise, in the automobiles to roads and vessels to ocean and so on. So we can write down the mediality of a part. And similarly, for the railway system, you can find it there. And hopefully you will find that it now, although the idea is quite simple, uh, the formalization, and although in a sense still simple, is not that simple. It takes a little bit of thinking to get a, a nice mediality. And then we have the attributes. So there are all those other quantifiable quantities of endurance. So for each part sort, we can identify one or more attribute types, A1, A2, capital A1, A2, or so. We can informally, in words, describe them. We can describe the attribute of servers uh, shown in the next but last line on the screen there, attribute of A1, attribute of A2, and so on, and invariance over these axioms. For example, and you can't read this, but it's okay, a railway unit can, or can be in a number of states. Either you can go in one direction or the other direction or in both directions. If it is a a point, skip the spore or a point, you can go either to the right or to the left or in the opposite directions. So that's the state and there's the state space. Railway units have length and railway units may... Okay, so that's some of these aspects, attributes. Lastly, before we leave endurance, we introduce the notion of intents. So artifacts are typically made to fulfill an intent. Yes, yes, I know that art, a painting like this, is painted with an intent, but it is not of the kind that I endeavor to describe. Uh, art is for my for other purposes. So example is that roads are to serve automobiles and that automobiles, their intent are to run on roads. In physics, you have the idea of a gravitational pull, uh, which can be not rationally, philosophically um, motivated and here I give an example of what I call an intentional pull. Namely, streets have automobiles, and automobiles are on streets, and we cannot have one without the other. Both are respective attributes, and they are intentionally linked that pull together, 
That is, if for a particular stretch of road, I observe that at such and such a time and such and such a position of the road, there was an automobile. I can talk about it, so it must be an attribute, so it must be recorded. Whether I record it or not depends on what purpose my domain description is to serve. Similarly, when I have, am an automobile, then I can talk about that automobile having been on that road at that time, at that position. And I cannot have one without the other. And that's the idea of the intentional pull. I think it's worth a further study. So this was the description calculus. Now comes the transcendental deduction part. So by transcendental we understand the philosophical notion, and by transcendental deduction a corresponding notion. I'll give you so we are here in the diagram. The first example is irrationally we can define relations such as identity, and you can see them all there. And by transcendental deduction, we can claim that space and time follows from these relations. And this is shown again and again in Kaiser and Anders books. Here's a second example closer to home. A train. You can observe, when you think of a train, you can think of it as standing on the platform or in the depot, or, and you're standing there, and it's a physical thing, like this row of desks is a physical thing. But you can also think of the train more or less implicitly as an attribute of a timetable. And finally, you can think of the train as it speeds down the line between two stations. And the first one I consider an endurant, and the last one I consider a perdurant. And the relation between them is what I would call a transcendation, transcendental deduction. I will focus on two, uh, two perdurants, namely channels and behaviors. So from the meteorologies, I can calculate which channels that are needed to communicate between parts, uh, between part behaviors. And from parts, we deduce behaviors. I've chosen to do so in, in the CSP form. And we can come back to that in the discussion later. So the general idea is to transcendentally deduce parts into behaviors. The signatures of whose definition incorporate, and you can see the bottom red lines, the part name uh, derived from the sort name, uh, a part identifier being a first argument, part meteorology being the second argument, the part static attributes, those whose value never change, being a third argument. The programmable attributes, those attributes of a part which change because that part behavior changes them into a further argument. And then the monitorable attributes, those that you cannot control, but you can observe them. Uh, as references to parts. And these are, the behaviors are thought of as uh, tailed recursively, uh, uh, behaviors as, as we can later on see. So for every pair of part identifiers, it may be that corresponding part behaviors may wish to communicate, all determined by the meteorology. So we can talk about in the CSP language as a channel declaration for all those channels. So for every endurant, we can now deduce its behavior. And uh, here's the overall structural one. We can deduce atomic behaviors, 
composite, concrete, and so on. And here's an example of a composite behavior with the argument as you saw it, uh, and then it is defined in terms of a function f, which when performed uh, may uh, render an updated meteorology if you are adding hops and, and links, uh, railway units and so on to a railway or a road, and updated uh, programmable variables, the train proceeds down the line and so on. And then the tail recursive application with the updated arguments. The red quotes before value and after the last end is to say that this uh, function, description function, generates text. It doesn't mean what uh, the language expression between the quotes expresses. So there is a description calculus. So we are ending that part and soon we will be finished. I remind you that there has been a number of case studies, some of them 120 pages of narratives and formula. The container line was done in collaboration last, the container terminals, the first one in 2019 was done in collaboration well, with uh, 34 students in my uh, fall course at East China Normal University and the AP Müller Mask terminal in Shanghai. And we all had a jolly afternoon going out there in the halfway through the project to quote unquote verify that our description perhaps uh, were moving in the right direction. And this has been done for a number of applications. So a new area, new, if I had uh, twisted the words and omitted the letter, I could say a new era of software of science and engineering has been outlined. Domain science can be and is related to computing science and software engineering. Hi, Tonetsky, he went blank. Is he snoring or what? Uh, it is suggested to precede requirements engineering and software development, and it can be studied or practiced independently of whether software is applied. This new science in it is bolstered, I claim, by a number of diverse studies, namely, as show, such as shown in the remainder of the thesis, further aspects of domain description, the semantics, quote unquote, of prompts, model of meriority, requirements derivation, and so on. I shall not cover them here, but I will certainly talk about it. So, domain science and engineering as a basis for understanding med, med worlds. Domain science and engineering as a basis for software development. The thesis of this submission is twofold. That it is a possible initial phase of software development and that it is a worthwhile topic of research. I support that claim by saying that the concepts of domain science and engineering are new, are well defined, and are given aspects, not full foundation, as we will discuss in this thesis, and that their role in software development is established. So, Immodestly, certainly, I would claim that domain science and engineering cast a completely new light on software development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dinis, and uh, we just have a, a five-minute break. Uh, to reorganize uh, for uh, the uh, defense part of the proceedings. And uh, 
if there are any questions ex arbitrio, please register with me in the break. I should also say that uh, restrooms are just across the hall, uh, outside, but uh, be back here in five minutes.
So we are now ready to uh, begin the Q&A part of the uh, defense. And as you can see, um, the first opponent has uh, entered the podium uh, and will lead the first series of the first discussion with the candidate. So please go ahead. Well, first of all, um, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation to talk here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at DTU again. Um, and very great honor to have the chance to meet and discuss with you finally. Um, perhaps I should say a little bit about what the committee uh, had planned here. Um, I'm sure all of you or many of you have copies of this. I mean, obviously, it's a lengthy book. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's possible to divide it into, let's say, two main component parts. Uh, the first component, roughly speaking, is the first chapter and, let's say, parts of the second. And then for the rest, uh, we have a slight shift, or rather we have a more detailed organization of material, uh, which is more directly to do with software engineering. Uh, roughly speaking, um, I'm going to be discussing, let's say, chapter one and so on, and uh, my colleague uh, Andre will be taking over and moving on deeper into the doctoral thesis is it a thesis it's a th it's just a th into the thesis uh, later on so we'll do it that way um, another thing I should say two remarks about me the first thing is uh, I suspect many people in this audience are either family or friends or are members of DTU compute uh, first thing I should say is I'm not um, a computer scientist myself I'm actually a logician and I'm looking at this as a logician. Now, I think this is actually an interesting perspective to look at these things because I think it throws some general light on things. Uh, I think it will enable me to maybe place it in a certain sort of intellectual context, which is one I'm very sympathetic to. Um, uh, as I say, uh, I am very much aware as a logician uh, that probably logic is a slightly strange word to a lot of you. I'll just say that in the course of my career, I've worked in oh, mathematics departments, computer science departments, computational linguistics departments, linguistics departments, and I'm now philosophy departments. And I think I can honestly say I am none of the above. But I do know something about the idea that maybe lies at the heart of all of them and that idea is summed up in the word logic so that's where I'm going from there's other one how can I put it one other nice thing I'd like to say about myself which I hadn't thought to mention but because of uh, the nice words about uh, Niels Bohr and about this being the 200 bicentenary of Erstel and his pioneering work on electromagnetism I thought I would mention that I'm actually from New Zealand uh, and if that doesn't ring any bells, I'll just say Ernest Rutherford, who was the guy who first split the atom, came from New Zealand and defies the first, well, let's say the first recent model of the atom, which was in fact the model of the atom. Uh, his model was sometimes called the plum pudding model of the atom. He did the famous experiment where he sent neutrons out and unexpectedly a large, of them, a large number of them bounced back most unexpectedly and it was that model which Niels Bohr turned into his, let's say, solar system, so pre-quantum model of the atom. So, so that's roughly where I'm coming from. Um, this is, I actually said when 
I was going to talk about this, that I was going to talk about chapter one. What is interesting, actually, is that you can see a lot of where this thesis is going, actually before you get to chapter one. If you carefully read through the abstract, if you read through the preface, if you look carefully at the words that are being said and the words that are used, you can actually get quite an accurate impression of some of the ways that this thesis is going. Indeed, to be honest, I mean, and this is said with the greatest positivity, I think you could almost, if, if you're good at looking at pictures, you can actually read quite a lot of about this thesis simply by viewing this picture on the cover. Now, if we were to sort of put on our conceptual glasses for a moment, if we were to think, let's say, um, let's say more as logicians or dare I say it as philosophers or something like that. Uh, if we look at this picture we can see quite a lot of structure there. Now first of all we see obviously a tree and of course we've seen the diagram of Linnaeus and so on. We know that trees give us a way of modeling phenomena in more and more detail and of classifying. And indeed for example there's interesting things you could do with this tree. You could chop it off down after a certain space. For example, here you've got a node living species. Well, you could put your finger on that and ignore that and just accept that, yes, here is a node. We can proceed to develop more structure and explore deeper. So in short, there's a node of classification. So this is one of the first borrowings, let's say, from philosophy or from logic or from something like that. Okay. Another most interesting thing is you can see a number of, let's say, technical words from philosophy, computer science, and so on. For example, one that was emphasized very much, the study of Mariology, which is, uh, it started with Lizhnevsky, a uh, famous Polish logician. I'm going to be brave and say somewhere around about the 1920s, but I'm being watched by somebody from Poland, and I've got a horrible feeling I've said that wrong. But very, very early in the 20th century, Lezhnevsky started developing his ideas on uh, Mariology, and these have developed. Um, there was an explosion of work on this in the 1970s uh, in the logical community, in the philosophical logical community, later on in the AI community, and so on. Uh, you get the word attributes and so on there. You also get, as you can see, that there's two blue boxes here. One talking about external qualities and one talking about internal qualities. So which relations do we find interesting and where do we locate the relations and the things that, that we are interacting? If you think about all the stuff that the words I've mentioned so far, we are very firmly looking at something which is about a methodology for modeling. Modeling what? Okay, and that's more the interesting. Modeling, because in modeling, of course, we're classifying, we're having to look at things both as things, as atomic lumps, you might say, which you link externally to other things, and also, let's come back to the atomic analogy, as atoms which used to be atoms but then you break them open and oh my goodness what's that are those let's call those protons let's call those neutrons Oof! do we possibly have some gluons holding quarks together and so on so external internal varying levels that need to be explored one of the more interesting parts in this diagram is the thing labeled transcendence and again one thing that plays an important role in the work here is the idea that you're using a transcendental deduction and without going into what that is at the moment I guess one thing you could say is that you're seeing there an arrow which is taking you from the blue box on the left to another tree which is labeled perdurance and that somehow as we know from the talk that these are things which exist in time let's let's roughly speaking say things which are somewhat more abstract and less concrete than the things we started with there is some sort of transformation 
if you want to think more in mathematical terms, there are some sort of function. If you want to go category theory, perhaps there's a sort of shift between two different categories. There's some sort of transformation going on there. What is it? Um, th my opponent here likes the word transcendental deduction here to describe what is going on. So already, as I said, I think you can um, see quite a lot of things. Just actually, just to, I, I tried to write down from the very last opponents that um, I think the very last slide at the bottom, you said something like domain science offers an interesting new perspective on modeling phenomena and a new way, you said, of thinking about software engineering. And yes, I'm entirely happy to agree with that. So that's good. what I would like to do is I would like to point out actually the main idea that is coming forward in this thesis is something that fits in rather well with certain trends of thought in various research areas that have taken place in the 20th century and you can push it back to the 19th century and even earlier and I, I would just like to discuss this because there is a certain richness here, and I think actually by locating what you're doing inside a broader framework, I think this could give rise to interesting things. It could give rise to interesting things. Let me start in by biting the bullet, because as a logician, I mean, uh, I'm always basically aware that when I say I'm a logician, people will mostly mishear me and think I said that I'm a magician and realize that I'm lying because you know I'm not very good at Adava Kadavra and all of those things. But um, how can I put it? One of the words that I wrote down when commenting upon this was the view that you're putting forward in this thesis. If you're coming, if you're viewing this as, as a logician, is in a certain sense, uh, and I wrote down the words, a fairly comfortable view. It fits. I mean, maybe you could think of the Danish word hugelit or something like this. It fits in well with the modern view of logic. And when I say the modern view of logic, at this stage of the proceedings, I'm talking, roughly speaking, about the post-1945 view of logic. And I say post-1945 here because the big change in logic that I'm talking about now is due to another Polish person, Alfred Tarski, who very, very firmly drew the distinction between syntax and semantics, except there was an awful lot more to it than that. Um, how can I explain this? Um, when you're teaching logic to basic classes, hmm, you do do things like try to say, well, here are certain logical things you can do, or if you're teaching it in a more mathematical way, here are certain patterns. If you're lecturing to a computer science audience, you're likely to say, look, here's this method called resolution, and it's only got one rule, so this is very good for implementation, or you might start talking about other things here. The thing that made Tarski's work interesting was that he mathematized the entire process of logic. Because the thing you have to realize is that although we do prove things with these formal logical languages, there is something else we do with formal logical languages. We use them to talk about things. We use them to describe things. We use them to pick out structures to say things which are true of some such as and false of other structures. What Tarski essentially did, he said, let's mathematize all of this so that we actually have the following structure. We've got a formal language on one hand, which is something quite simple usually, some recursively generated thing, and on the other, we've got a set of models, or to use your term, a set of domains. Basically, we've got the things we want to talk about and a collection of relations over those things. 
and most importantly of all, you mathematize the link. You formally describe how one of these simple languages describes this. In other words, you've stepped up to a meta-language, as Tarski would like to say. You have defined a notion of truth or satisfaction, and you are now dealing with a language, the domains, and how such a language says things about this domain. So to put it another way, I always like to think about logic as the Janus-faced science. I mean Janus-faced because Janus is the famous, and I'm going to say the wrong word here, Greek or Roman. I know I'll say it both and put an or in it because I'm a, I'm a logician. <laughs> it's one of those gods of antiquity, but it was the god with two faces, faced both directions at once so that actually when you're working with logic on the one hand you may more be thinking about the nature of your descriptions or you may be thinking about the nature of the things you describe the domain okay and what you can say with them and what you can find out this is a little different from ordinary mathematics, by the way, because in ordinary mathematics, what we tend to do is dive into the domain and say, oh, that's a topological space. We don't care how we talk. Oh, that's a, that's a ring, say. Oh, that's a freely generated group, whatever. That's a finite group. We don't care how we talk about it. Logic adds this thing that we talk about descriptions and and what? Well, just to give you a little bit, actually it turned out to be a fairly useful thing to do. During the 1960s, they discovered lots of exciting things about set theory. It got very technical and so on. In the 1970s, computer science came along. Uh, they tended to work with much weaker languages because mm, they prefer finite structures, you know, you know things like uh, uh, data types and so on. They were more interested in language with, with things like transitive closure, taking fixed points and so on. Things got very interesting in that way. But again, we had logic doing all of these things. Here is where I'm going to turn around and try and make the connection with your work. One of the things, one of my heroes, um, one of my heroes is somebody called uh, Richard Montague, uh, who was a Californian, actually a student of Tarski's, as it happened. And um, he... Um, He had the idea that you could analyze ordinary natural languages, look at their meanings using the tools of logic. Uh, he started doing this roughly about 1968. He died in 1972, but he started this work in, how can I put it, formally defined uh, natural language semantics, which has mutated into computational things. Now, now a lot of this is just, I, I would say, everyday stuff that you can do with fairly standard computational tools, but basically showing how you can turn things about natural language into things that you can actually compute with, reason with, work with, and so on. Here, we're beginning to get into contact with your territory in one way, because how can I put it? That was also this, around about the same stage when somebody you've also mentioned, you got also the birth of semantics of programming languages. So in particular, you got uh, the work of Dana Scott trying to, exactly as you said when you were working with Vienna, trying to explicate what it was that get, what, what a computer programming language could mean. And he invented the thing called denotational semantics. There's a beautiful, beautiful textbook on this. It's it probably hideously out of date now. It's not one of the up-to-date ones on semantics of programming languages. But it's by a guy called Joseph Stoy. I think it was first published in 1981. And that was, that was the first one I read on this topic. But it's also beautiful because it's got this introduction by um, Dana Scott. And he was talking about his co-author, who wasn't this mathematician in the same way, a, a guy called Christopher Strachey, who was somebody who was very, very enthusiastic that in order to understand computer languages, you had to work with these crazy structures that could do these crazy things, and they didn't make sense, until Dana Scott showed how you could technically make them make sense. Now, sometimes I've taught pro courses in programming language semantics, and suddenly and sometimes I've taught courses in natural language semantics because they're very closely related to the basic tools and so on. You use lambda calculus, you use all of these things. One of the things I often tell my class is 
semantics of programming languages is easier. Now, why would I say such a thing? I'll tell you why I say such a thing. When you are trying to work with something mathematical, if you start with something that is very, very well defined and you've got an absolutely precise grip on it from the start, that's half the battle. In particular, pretty much everybody nowadays, well, I would say virtually everybody, is convinced that we have a very, very deep understanding of what computation is. I mean, quite simply, we've got the church Turing thesis, we are satisfied we know what is computable, we're equally satisfied that there are things that are non-computable, we've got very, very stable models of computation, I, I, I have no idea how many models of computation there exist. We've got a solid starting point. When you're trying to investigate how language works, you can do a lot of stuff. You could point to puzzles, you could point to things, but there comes always this barrier. To really take things further, you need to know something about that domain that we call the real world. And we also need to know about some really weird stuff in that world. For example, we might need to know something about naive physics, you know, like <gasps> what happens when we spill water? Or no, why does the water flow that way? How do we react? There's also these rather strange things that live in this world that seem to have a mind of their own and do all kinds of unplanned things for semi-random reasons. I, they're called human beings, something like that. And apparently they can affect things. So you add those into the equation, you've got to reason about their behavior. You don't want to know. Okay. In other words, one of the things you do is that you realize that if you want to keep giving precise pictures out of that, at some stage you've got to, let's say, step outside a certain comfort zone where you're dealing with everything that is defined and extend the tools that you're using to model to a richer world out there. And you might say that a lot of the history of artificial intelligence uh, in the 20th century is partly about attempts to do this. For example, I've used the idea of naive physics. So this was, say, something done by Patrick Hayes and so on, trying to get to grips with the sort of physics that we do. This is very, very early AI. Nowadays, of course, we think we've got a much, much better way to do it because we have the internet and, of course, we can just suck as much data as we like, admittedly semi-structured, very raw data, maybe text, maybe video. We can sort of throw learning programs at it. We can analyze it statistically. We've got big data with the emphasis on the big. That's another way of trying to make some sort of mathematical sense out of all this stuff. This, roughly speaking, is why I was finding what you were saying very sympathetic, because the basic point that you're making, that in order to go, you gave at the start, you gave this triptych thing that we started off with, software specification, thinking about software, and moving down to getting down to requirement specification. And how can I put it? I mean, there just is the point which you make very, very clearly, that in order to do this, what can I say? You do, if in a certain sense, have to step outside the comfort zone. You have to find ways of adapting the mathematical tools, the logical tools, the way of thinking and so on out there where things aren't quite as safe, where there isn't always an agreed upon definition where things that work. You will have to fiddle around maybe, you'll have to experiment, you'll have to probably to get things wrong an awful lot of time before you get things right. So yes, I'm in total. For example, I, I very much liked your list of um, I very much like your list of domains that you give in here and that you gave up there where you listed everything from credit card verification because that's going to bring those funny things called human beings into play, you know, and all the weird stuff they do with credit cards like steal them and misuse them over to, actually right now I've forgotten the other ones, but there was this big list, oh yes, container ships, railways and so on and so forth. Those are the things that need modeling and these lead us in many different directions. What tools do we need? 
As I said, um, I'm a logician, but I must admit that I, ha I knew very little about CSP or, uh, and so on before I had read this, so I do not present to be an expert, and I'm not going to go into all of this because we have my esteemed uh, colleague over here who will be turning to this later. But I would like to dig into, um, dig into some of these things just a little bit more. One, one of the things that you get when you're modeling, say, in things like natural language, is the need to introduce often abstract entities. Now, without going into a lot of details, and I'm mentioning this example because you make reference to this work, one of the things that you do, for example, if you're trying to mathematically or logical uh, um, natural language, say, stuff to do with time, you realize that it's actually going to be very useful to have something like events for the simple reason that you really want some kind of abstract entity out there that you could keep on hanging extra attributes on. So there is something and it was an eating event. Oh, it was a long event. Oh, it was a boring event. Oh, it was a coronavirus unfriendly event. But to put it in computer science terms, you need some kind of data structure that you can keep on hooking stuff on. You could try and work with other kinds of data structures, but that sort of data structure, something which permits you to add on things in random order, fits in with the sort of logical reasoning much better. Okay. Um, and sorry, I'm getting a little bit lost here. Uh, let me just uh, catch up. Um, so to come back to the point that I was sort of saying uh, about the three things that need to be for formalized, um, there's very often you need to formalize the language and there's sort of certain paths that you can take as being formalized, but how you actually go on to formalize the more abstract matters, for example, a natural language semanticist might use events, you, you here are using uh, things like perdurance and so on to do this. Um, there, okay. Let me come back to that. There was another thing that got me reading this, and this was just another, actually, a, a number of other analogies that got me from uh, things that I've been encountered um, in my own work in logic. I should say, at, at, at the risk of sort of confusing everybody, I'd like to, I mean, I've mentioned New Zealand, I've mentioned Poland, we've mentioned Denmark. Uh, if you will forgive me, I'd like to bring in another place, and that place is called Amsterdam. And yes, it's a country not too far, not far, not too far from here. But not only would I describe myself as a logician, I would also describe myself as an Amsterdam logician, which roughly speaking means that um, somebody who thinks from this very model-based perspective about splitting things into what you're talking and the way you, how you talk and the way you're talking things to, which goes to this, uh, let, let's say, the, the professor of logic there, Johan van Bentham, who retired recently, but is sort of, I would say, one of the leading logicians at the moment. Now, again, another analogy that struck me, which I enjoyed very much, was one of the things that hit Amsterdam logic and natural land, language semantics was what you might call the dynamic turn. Uh, I've mentioned earlier, for example, that um, I've mentioned earlier, for example, that uh, my hero Richard Montague, who explained a lot about how we model how we model semantics, but in a sense, you might say, he gave us a model for the static entities. This is an analogy, but something like your endurance, you might say. When you're really looking at language, what usually happens is we use language over time. More information comes in. How do we link it up? Also, whereas people have got this terrible habit of talking and disagreeing and changing each other's minds and doing all sorts of things. In other words, there's a lot of dynamics. How do you model that? And again, I, f I saw a certain analogy with uh, your work here. You've got this big thing all through the 1990s and uh, 1980s about adding dynamics to this work. Nowadays, um, 
how could you say there's been this sort of dynamic turn in another branch of logic more concerned with how we reason about changing knowledge actually there's at least two very prominent uh, DTU researchers interested in this for example you've got Thomas Boland uh, the professor here and his work on epistemic planning and you've got Nina Gira Simchuk who's done very beautiful work on linking all of this stuff to learning theory um, now here is where I'm going to make a bridge to the transcendental deduction because this is slightly where I'm not hmm, can I just go slowly here and maybe start uh, I, I'm aware that I've been talking far too much but I, I would like to uh, uh, ask you some questions here now here we come to this thing called the transcendental deduction okay a little bit of history but from another thing, the transcendental deduction. A philosopher would probably say something like this, that basically this transcendental deduction is how we get at what might be called a priori knowledge. Now, what's a priori knowledge? Well, okay, a priori knowledge is meant to be the sort of knowledge that we have before we look at the world. Are there such kinds of knowledge? Well, it depends who you talk to, but for example, many people would be entirely happy to say that, let's say, knowledge of the basic facts of arithmetic like 7 plus 5 equals 12. Whenever I say that, there's this moment of panic when I'm sure that I'm going to say the wrong number. I'm going to say 7 plus 5 is 13 or that 7 plus 5 actually wasn't 12 today and I screwed it up. I should stick with 1 plus 1 equals 2 because, you know, I can utter that without even a fragment of doubt in my head. But, okay. That we do have this kind of knowledge and the question is, where do these kind of knowledges come from? Some of these knowledges are very, very interesting, and again, they become step by step interesting the more we step out into the world. What we really do know, like for example, for computer scientists, I think um, one very nice possibility for a priori knowledge, perhaps even one, no, I won't, I won't call that a priori, I'll, I'll come back to that example. The classic example, I would say, of um, a priori knowledge in the philosophical literature is knowledge of cause and effect. And roughly speaking, this problem comes about as follows. Um, it really goes back to a famous English, and this is the important point, empiricist philosopher, which means somebody who says, we learn from experience. That's where we learn for, and is unwilling to admit, make too many assumptions about what we actually know. Uh, David Hume in a famous thing was talking about, say, people playing the game of billiards and how balls bounce off each other. And he basically asked a very, very easy question. He says, well, how do you know it's going to work like that? I mean, how do you know that maybe the two balls aren't going to go along and they're going to stop? Or one's just going to go completely crazy? Yeah, we know, you know, David Hume liked playing billiards. We know how to play billiards. We know that. But is our belief that tomorrow is going to work exactly the same way is that a rational belief or not is that something we could prove now david hume was a very smart guy he was an empiricist and he basically just sort of said well look i believe that what we know we learn from the sense i look as many times as i like at what's going on do you see a cause out there no you just see billiard ball billiard ball that's it you don't see anything else. Somehow you've come to believe that there is something out there, but you can't point out there and see a cause. If you're going to be an empiricist, just accept it. It's a nice belief. It works. Now let's drink something and get on with playing billiards. He was basically a skeptic, but a very comfortable skeptic who liked playing billiards and probably drinking too much port. Kant came along and did not like this. And this is where the famous transcendental, one of the famous first transcendental things, Kant thought that he could prove that actually 
there has to be cause and effect in the world. Well, because I, I won't run through his argument, but it's a nice argument. Very roughly speaking, what these transcendental arguments they always work like is they point to something that everybody agrees on and Kant pointed in a sense to the fact that we have experience and in effect he said to Hume look you believe that we have experiences in our head if there really was a possibility of not having cause and effect the world would not be ordered in the way there is there could be no consciousness and hence cause and effect Transcendental deductions usually take this form. They're a way of battling skepticism. They like to pick something that says, okay, we agree on that, this fact. For that fact to be there, the world would have to work this way. You'd have to make these assumptions. Or not really so much make an assumption, more the world would have to work that way, so we better go with that. So they're kind of strong, tough arguments. Here's kind of my first question. You, I, I can see why you did it. For you, in a sense, you explain a transcendental deduction as being more a translation from one particular way of looking at something to a different language. In other words, you, you don't, your preferred way of saying what a transcendental deduction is as a translation between two ways of speaking, and you give nice examples of that. Is there a reason that you, whereas I must admit, I prefer, let's say the more classic formulation that, you know, something, here's something we agree on that's possible, the world would have to be it like that way. Why do you put it the way that you put it? I'm, I'm curious. Why, why, do you, why, do, why do you formulate it that way? I like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Dean is the... I can even repeat this. I like that question. I sometimes have my doubts as to whether this what I call deduction from endurance to perdurance is really a transcendental deduction in the sense that, for example, Kaiser Lander introduces mm -hmm. um, let me give you a quip that, that's another way of saying not very respectful answer uh, and that is, it, it suited my purpose. It, it, it was a way of, of avoiding to have to go into a deeper rational uh, chain of arguments to justify it. It all started way, way back uh, when one year in 1975 to 76, I was a guest professor at Copenhagen University's computer science department. And that was a very interesting person. He was not employed there. I'm extremely sad that I cannot remember his name anymore. He was very active in data modeling. And he had exactly the example I gave you, with a train standing on the platform uh, in the implicitly mentioned in the timetable and otherwise feeding down the line and he wanted to understand how one morphed into the other so to speak mm -hmm. excuse me <coughs> and and i think he, uh, if it isn't a transcendental deduction in either of the two senses kaiser landers or emmanuel kant's then well it will be a transcendental deduction in the sense of the inspiano uh, I picked on it. You asked, why did you pick that? Mm -hmm. I picked on it because that was a way in which I could uh, explain something that could not mathematically, logically, but perhaps logically, philosophically be explained. Um, certainly, uh, if I go back to the other, to the 
more well-known examples in, 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 in uh, Kaiser Landers works from his earliest book in 1940 to his latest in, in 16, 2016, and hopefully one is coming out. Uh, there are, if not zillions, there are dozens upon dozens of transcendent deduction of that kind. And, and uh, since, and, and this is where the introduction you gave uh, came uh, as a very nice, uh, almost godsend uh, introduction. I, I like that because uh, you were basically, I, I'll come back to the de deduction in, in a but you were, uh, uh, a, I was grappling with how do I describe uh, what you call the real world, the, and in our particular case, the man-made aspects. Well, as I implied earlier, uh, I was well steeped under the baton of Dana Scott, who often came to the Vienna Labor, and Christopher Strachey, and so on, in the semantic programming language. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, a domain theory for some activity, human activity, uh, a domain description, gives the semantics of the terms that workers in that domain speak, mm -hmm. uh, explicitly or implicitly. And coming back now to the transcendent deduction, for them, uh, for them to make that jump, in a sense, mental jump, from the endurance to the perdurance, mm -hmm. um, I needed some uh, magic wand uh, in Trudersdale or something. And uh, I latched uh, on, on this transcendent deduction as being a way I'm still not certain that it is, but I, so that as I, and, and maybe I will switch to follow up on, on something that you, um, there is a remark in, in the assessment report mm -hmm. written by all of you, thank you very much. Um, and the remark is the, the, uh, the magenta color one, yes that I somehow have a light uh, engagement with philosophers and logicians. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it is a light engagement, mm -hmm. but it permeates everything. Mm -hmm. And here is my, yes indeed, somewhat unusual, I use philosophy. Now, philosophy is, is really basically, some people say useless, to me, it has been extremely useful in sorting out, in trying to clarify some of the many problems you listed in the beginning of your intervention here. Namely, uh, come to grips with uh, how to gravel uh, when it's informal and so on. So, I do not question it. I do not extend or modify these logics. Uh, I accept them as a, ba as a basis. Uh, it is for real philosophers to question and so on. If someone shows that that basis is wrong, okay, then I'll say, and no one has shown that Kaiser Lattner's philosophy is wrong in the last 26 years, uh, then I can only claim that within my use of it, it works. <coughs> and yes. that's all I need. I hope that this work could spur somebody uh, more proficient, uh, a philosopher, to, to do something about it, to clarify some of these things. So, yes, I'm afraid that the answer to your question, why did I pick on, on, on the right, morphing from one to the other? Uh, in a sense, uh, I, I, I did imply, if, if we go back a little bit here, uh, 
there is basically that that uh, that domain function there that describe behavior that you see there. It looks very formal. It looks like you know, mm -hmm. it takes a formal thing, informal thing, formally described. It takes that and generates a formal text, uh, and and uh, the parameters that you find are all calculated from observations. So in that sense, maybe it is not really a transcendental deduction, but merely a. a um, one of many possible functions that could be written from one to the other. Okay. From one to the other. I, I, as the assessment committee observes elsewhere, I say that, uh, I even claim that, that all these things we call uh, abstract interpretation, beyond the claims that all abstract interpretations are really examples of that. In that sense, yes. The static semantics of a programming language for which I've been given the grammar, I could have given many different kinds of uh, static semantics. One that took inheritance the other way around, uh, the distinction between macros and procedures in the 1960s were examples of that. So there are many kinds. So, um, so that was just an example that, that Yes, I, I open for that possibility, but for me it was enough to, to say Eureka, that's okay. what I want. Now, now I, I misuse my time to reply. Uh, so I have a light engagement with philosophers, uh, and it works. And then I go through step by step. Uh, uh, in my thesis, uh, how I use uh, that philosophy, and, and uh, one by one by one by one, you can find them all. And the easiest thing is in the PDF document you just search, and you find all these places where philosophy, and and uh, that's how I use it. And that's unusual for a philosopher to have to read about somebody using their philosophy mm. rather than. Uh, I don't think you, you, you ought to change that a little bit there, or I disagree with you there. I'm not extending and modifying it, in that sense. Okay. Um, so, on, I think it was on page 63, um, you, you talk about the transcendental deduction again, but then you make this very nice um, little remark say something like it might be interesting to look for other examples in computer science and I, I've let, can I just describe an example to you I'm just curious as to what you think about it this this was the example I didn't really go into earlier when I mentioned our priori knowledge that was the sort of knowledge we have before we look at the world um, but I'm just wondering whether this would count as a transcendental deduction or what kind of knowledge this is. Just coming back to the um, famous thing in computer science which gets it started, uh, the Turing Church thesis. I mean this basically goes back to Gödel's famous proof of uh, incompleteness where he basically realizes during the course that he needs to talk about computation in some sense but this is before anybody's got a clue about computation. So he sort of invents on the fly the idea of recursive functions and uses those to carry out the coding. Then you get people like Alonzo Church who comes along and invents the lambda calculus as a model of computation. And then you get the famous example of Alan Turing who sits down and literally thinks, what does it mean to compute? What have we got? And he does this little thought experiment. Well, we need memory. You know? There's got to be states, and it's something about manipulating symbols. And I mean, I guess everybody from DT, DTU Compute knows how the story ends. You know that all of these come to the same thing: lambda calculus, RAM machines, you name it. Dom, 
okay, they compute the same stuff. Uh, and then if you start getting into complexity theory, you know, they're all sort of nicely polynomial. Turing machines are nicely, you know, polynomially invariant, so they're even good for computing complexity classes and so on. It's ridiculous. Um, so it seems like we've got this very nice, stable notion, but we kind of got out of it out of thin air, though we did have to do a lot of work. Now, is that a priori knowledge? Is that a transcendental deduction? Because it's clearly coming up with some deeply, deeply, deeply trusted knowledge. I mean, maybe it's not as big as coming up with the concept of numbers. I'm not quite sure about that. It seems a pretty big concept, the concept of computing. What sort of concept is that? Is, is that, I guess, a ha priori? But then again, we're talking about manipulating symbols as well. There seems to be a certain how the world works in it. And yet, on the other hand, yeah. I mean, it just seems, you know, all the models are the same. It doesn't compute everything. You've got a universal machine there. You can do that. What sort of concept is that? I mean, it's a pretty amazing concept. Empirical, a priori. I, I, is, it, is that a transcendental? Did Turing do a transcendental deduction? A very no. long one. No. No? Okay. okay. Uh, but for a different reason. Oh, okay. for, uh, if he had done what he did. Yes. And somebody else or himself in a totally different field. Mm -hmm. Let's say the field of arts. Right. Of uh, paintings. Of our appreciation. Or maybe not non-appreciation. Abhorrence or whatever. If he had there established a similar connection between, yeah. say, uh, the, the palette, the colors, the pencils, and the canvas uh, on one side, and then the product, the painting, on the other side, that, that transformation there. Mm -hmm. If he had been able to carry that, or similar, say, for a composer of music, Mm -hmm. Then that would have been pre, and then there could be many, many more. Then there would be a whole family of such things, and we would need to give a name to it, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the name could be that of a transcendental deduction. Could, I suggest. Whereas, to apply it for just having done one of the things, but not the others, I think that's why I said no. I think. It is a discovery, an invention, rather than a, a deduction. Um, I, th I would say offhand. Okay. That, that, Patrick, the trouble with your questions is that they are so, they provoke a little more deeper thinking than I can perform here on stage within the oh, okay. six hours we have officially been given. <laughs> no, they're, they're good. Sorry for, for judging you. Actually, I, I, at the risk of um, at the risk of boring you too much, um, I do have one other question related to this. Like one of the you, I mean, how can I put it? Um, I mean, transcendental deductions didn't um, die out with Kant. I mean, for example, in the 1960s, you know, the 1960s, oof, uh, there was a big kind of resurgence of uh, interest in them. Um, ah, without going, I mean, there, there was a famous, um, there's a famous philosopher called uh, Hilary Putnam, for example. Um, he's interesting because uh, he's one of the ones who, he's one of the guys who helped prove the undecidability of uh, solubility of Diophantine equations. So we use, often see it called the MRDP theorem, so that there's no algorithmic solution to Diophantine equations. Well, the P in that, that's Putnam, Hilary Putnam. And you may have heard very recently there's been a lot of uh, people, say, at Oxford and so on, uh, playing with the idea, or oh, very trendy internet meme, that we're all living in a computer simulation. You know, that there's no way to tell the difference. We're all living in a computer simulation. And in the fact, probabilistically, it makes more sense to assume that we're living in a computer simulation and so on. So interesting arguments. 
Well, back in the ah, da, 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 1971 or so, um, Hilary Putnam came up with this uh, transcendental deduction, basically showing that it can't possibly be true. Okay, you can show... I, I won't go into it here, but he sort of said you can prove that we're not living in a computer simulation. So somebody's got to be wrong. Um, but also there was a lot of blowback against them, you know, as, you know, these are this... Now, one of, the, one of the things that really gets me about transcendental deductions is that they're always anti-skeptical arguments. I mean, this is... There's a skeptic, somebody doubts that you can get something, there's certainty, so Kant comes along with a transcendental deduction. And now here's a, really, here's a really dumb question. What if you're, you know, and I, I probably put myself in this cap, what if you're a pretty happy skeptic? What if you're just sort of sort of saying, well, no, I don't know how we really know this, but hey, you know, seems to work. You know, I'm pretty happy, you know, we keep on trying. What if, what if you're taking a very pragmatic attitude? For example, one thing. Now, you, you're talking about, you know, say, endurance being perdurance and so on. Fine. And in some sense, it seems to me that you would like some certainty there or some... But there's also a part of me that's sort of saying something like, and please, please forgive me, something like, why not go online and just try and sort of see whether you can sort of derive the endurant perdurant distinction by machine learning or something. In other words, what I'm trying to say is why not be somebody who happily works from the bottom up and accepts there ain't no certainty in this life, it's about statistics, it's about probability, da -de da -de da instead of insisting that we must work for and we must have certainty instead of coming down from the top. What if you want to be a happy skeptic? Maybe slightly lazy and, you know, just let the machine learning do it all. Sorry, sorry. I, this Sunday, I came in contact for the first time in 30 years with a former PhD student of mine, uh, Peter Michael Bohn, and a brilliant student, brilliant young man, now chief technologist at Hewlett Packard Enterprises here in Denmark. He had seen my the thesis, uh, being a brilliant young man, not maybe not so young anymore. He had clearly read into a sizable part of chapter one and could explain how what he had done in the last four or five years was quote unquote exactly that. Okay. And I look forward and since I do respect his brilliance, and uh, he made wonderful things, uh, I'm looking forward to meet him and to see what he's doing. And he claims to have done basically what you said. Oh. To take uh, endurance descriptions and then write a program and write a computer function that actually generated uh, the Perdurance, okay. the description of the perdurance. Now, um, there could be some misunderstanding in our communication uh, or so on. We'll see. Uh, that was one aspect I wanted to say. And now, of course, I have forgotten the other aspect, but I'll come across it, I'm sure. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, could you repeat part of your question then? Um, yes, I, I, it was really about, in a sense, it was, um, even though I said it in a joking way, I think it's quite an important point, why instead of starting with the certain patterns and deriving from that, is it possible to learn a lot of the structure? I mean, in a sense, you're almost asking, can you learn logical structure from the bottom up? you know, learning how to sort of derive certain concepts, the sort of, learn, you know, using things like learning theory and so on. Is it possible to kind of like get good, stable approximations of concepts, you know, essentially by sucking in data and just using standard sort of algorithms like uh, various kinds of machine learning algorithms? And, and so to on. that, I, I am sorry to say I don't know. No, no, well, no. it's worse than that. I haven't even thought about it as such. Okay. I'm not reflected upon it in the way that you 
uh, outline. Uh, and I certainly hope that maybe some of the younger bright ones here uh, would do that, because it, it, it sounds to me uh, quite interesting. It, the thing about examinations, and ladies and gentlemen, this is an examination, my first in I don't know how many years, but certainly I enjoy it. The thing about it is that, that um, you are expected to react in more or less real time. And uh, the matters that you are touching upon are of a nature for which that cannot be done. Because otherwise they wouldn't be interesting. They would be superficial things and therefore I, okay. No, 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 I, I, I certainly don't. Uh, oh, I, I, would, I did say I'm going to, I think probably um, we're running, well, I know theoretically I've got more time, but I don't think we should uh, uh, go on for too long. I would actually like to jump out of chapter one into page 102, uh, 102 which is in chapter two. Uh, just, there was, um, just a remark on another link that I saw between the sort of work, say, that I'm familiar with in natural language semantics and the work that you do here. It's a very, it's a very nice paragraph. Um, so I'll just read what you wrote there. You said, we have seen that to model the full spectrum of domain facets, one needs not one, but several specification languages. No single specification language suffices. It seems highly unlikely that it appears not to be desirable to obtain a single universal specification language capable of equally, elegantly, suitably, abstractly modeling all aspects of a domain. Hence, one must conclude that the full modeling of domains shall deploy several formal notations, including plain good old mathematics in all its forms. Yes, agreed. The issues are then the following. Which combinations of notations to select and how to make sure that the combined specification denotes something meaningful? Uh, the ongoing series of integrating formal methods conferences is a good source for techniques, compositions, and meanings. So I just wanted to say, and this is from somebody from a very different thing, I'm, I'm in complete and total there. You know, I mean, I, I think one needs ridiculously rich ontologies to put it, yeah. to, to, to do this, and to try and to have some abstract idea that it's best doing it from some common base, I, th I think is... Presumptuous and delusory, probably, but yeah, just to say that I agree. But look, um, I, I, um, I think in a sense, I mean, there's more questions I could, but I think maybe it's a good time for me to um, just close down and to, just to say thank you very much and uh, thank you very much for, for this. And it was just very, very nice to see. How can I put it? Yet another page open for me in the world of logic or something like that and to sort of see some of these ideas in a very, very different form than what I'm used to. So, and uh, yes, I think I'll just finish that there. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Blackburn. And uh, we'll immediately proceed with the second opponent Professor Taleski. Uh, yes, uh, welcome everybody. Philosophical. Uh, and uh, left me with a little bit more technical parts. But before I go into my questions and, and discussion with Dines, uh, let me apologize for not being able to be over there. I regret this very much. Uh, it would be fun to be with, the, with you all over there. But I guess under the circumstances, there was no, simply no other chance it, we had to arrange this like that. Second, uh, let me thank you very much indeed for inviting me to the assessment committee for this procedure. Uh, it's been work, of course, but uh, primarily for me, I feel it has been a privilege and an honor uh, to take part in this assessment procedure for 
for the work of Dines Bjorner in particular. Professor Dines Bjorner, one of the people who have been founders and leaders of the discipline of software engineering. Uh, Dines already admitted that he's been working in the field for uh, well over half a century by now. And uh, uh, I should hasten to add that, that I've known Dines for about two thirds or three quarters of that period, which is a very long time indeed. And I really uh, should say that I admire uh, Dines always and admire him now also in this thesis, which we are discussing now for a very um, consequent pursuit and promotion of the very serious attitude towards software engineering, uh, which is not like what we encounter very often in business-like environments these days, uh, whatever things are, it's fine as long as they sell, uh, but really the attitude to which Dines promoted and which we, very many of us, subscribe to as well, uh, has always been that uh, things must be governed by the idea of the high quality, good understanding, precision, rigor, formal methods, etc., etc., uh, in uh, formal in, in software development. Uh, Dines has been one of the leading figures in this community uh, uh, through at least three strands of his activity. On one hand, and that's what we'll be, we are talking about today, his own, uh, uh, don't blush Dines, I think this is all true. Uh, uh, first of all, through his own research, uh, second, through his work as a group leader, team leader, project leader for very many influential and successful undertaking. And I do say, uh, for those who know Dines, the third strand, perhaps equally important or even more important, is his uh, administrative, organizational activity, involvement, energy, so many various organizations, uh, institutions, uh, and individuals uh, uh, owe to him uh, many, many thanks and sometimes even their own um, existence. I'm just saying this uh, to thank Dines for many years of his work, uh, but uh, also just to stress that we are, what we are discussing here is just a small part of just one of the very many activities Dines uh, has been uh, carrying out over the years. So, uh, what I have to say about the thesis itself is that when I read it for the first time, it in a way came as a surprise to me, uh, largely because uh, it's so uh, in a way different than what I've been considering uh, to be the opus magnum of, of Dines's achievements, the, the, the three volumes of the software engineering book published what, by about, I know, probably about 10 years ago by now or something like that, right? Over there, it was a complete presentation of a very mature area, very mature discipline uh, with its own uh, mathematical underpinnings, with its own foundations, with its own methods, with a lot of practice and experience uh, which both Dines personally and the community he leads uh, accumulated over the years. It's so much sure that it could have been presented nicely and precisely uh, for an undergraduate uh, student, even if there are plenty of non-trivial non nuances and technicalities and, and sort of background stuff which is, which is over there. Here we are on a completely different ground and I, again, admire Dines for uh, undertaking this task and, and uh, attacking a completely new field, a completely new area, which we were all aware of, because of course, talking about domain engineering and domain knowledge uh, has been present around uh, for quite a while, even in Dines's own work, even this, this three volume of software engineering refers to this triptych approach at some volume three somewhere, you can't remember where exactly. Uh, so this was around, but uh, uh, I think what Dines undertakes here uh, is to actually uh, develop it fully and seriously. Now, uh, I 
think we all agree that the thesis which we are discussing is not a um, closing up thesis. It's not a monograph which which uh, completes the picture. It's uh, on the contrary. It's a monograph which which uh, uh, opens up and puts questions uh, forward and uh, leaves things open and there are plenty of eyes to be dotted and plenty of areas where research is needed and plenty of if you permit me Dines, you know me small technical inaccuracies to be uh, to be corrected i'm not going to refer to this uh, today uh, but uh, i think this this tip of the iceberg, which we see here, is very important. And I certainly would like to start by saying that I, I am confident that this is important, this is useful, and this is necessary for the uh, proper, complete picture of the software um, development from the very vague idea of where we work. This is the, the main uh, treatment through precise, formal specification of the software requirements down to software design and, and actual coding and programming on all, all, all these which comes uh, afterwards. Uh, as I said, um, I'm not going to pretend I'm going, I'm, 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 I will be able to uh, follow up the wonderful, half jokingly, philosophical poetry uh, Patrick presented and you did to discuss just now and uh, uh, which uh, of which that the chapters one and two are full. Uh, this is not what I am good at. I think well, if I am good at something, then I'm much better at the technical issues, the real foundations, the mathematics, which is there or should be there, and the actual connection with the practical foundations of software engineering. So if you permit me, few questions, uh, some of them already touched upon and uh, not so much concerning the, you know, yes and no technical answers, but rather, uh, I think with an eye open towards what should happen and what will be happening with the future with the topic, because this is where the real interest now uh, is, because we are in a new area. So the first thing I would like to, to, to ask you about, and I must admit, I have forgotten about the passage, uh, the, the last passage Patrick read from, uh, from your monograph uh, about the need for the diversity of formalisms and, and, and calculi and approaches to describe the domain uh, requirements. Uh, now, I do appreciate the fact that there is a need for domain requirements. That's absolutely certain. We have to understand the domain in order to do something for this domain or in this domain. However, uh, what usually happens these days without this domain engineering fully developed and fully blown up and perhaps even appreciated is that actually when you present a software requirement specification, then good deal of the domain knowledge is typically included there. You describe the concepts and the operations and the, 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 the properties at least as far as they are necessary or relevant for the software uh, which you are to develop, which, which you are, the, well, for which, which you are specifying. Is there for any sharp distinction or borderline perhaps between the actual domain engineering and the specification engineering. I mean, you, you touch upon this in your monograph, for example, when you talk about the uh, shard requirements versus derived requirements for the machine part of the development and things like that. Uh, so uh, can, we, can we actually distinguish between the two phases uh, in any kind of a precise way? And both from the kind of a methodology and, and, and conceptual and neat point of view, as well as from the technical point of view. That is whether you env envisage that the, there will be some specific uh, domain description languages, just as we have now specification uh, building languages. 
will, the, will there be different formalisms? In one of the remarks in your thesis, you actually uh, allude to the fact that you will not talk about the proofs for domain descriptions formalism because there is plenty of those for the specification requirements uh, analysis. I can't remember the exact formulation, but there is a footnote to, to this account somewhere. So do you think that we just inherit stuff from the specification formalisms and use it for domain description, or there will be something completely new, completely different? And if so, whether it will be one or many or some kind of a heterogeneity which will enter there, I wouldn't be myself if I wouldn't ask, you know, many logics for the same purpose for various facets of the domains, etc. Dines. Thank you. <clears throat> and let me try and understand your question. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> you cannot hear me. Uh, I think the technician is working on it. Can you hear me now? I can see that you, that Dines is speaking and he can't I, hear I'm speaking into the microphone I was to supposed to talk into. He still, uh, Tadetsky can still not hear. He's working. Hello. Uh, can you hear me now? No. He, he can see that I, I'm can speaking. Can you hear anything? No. Oh, no. I think uh, I think the young man down there got it fixed. Yes. So let me try and understand your question. Uh, at one point in your question, you used the two words. Uh, you used the word domain description. Then you used specification. Then you used domain requirement, then you use derived requirement. Now, which of the, which pairing of these are you concerned about? The uh, definitely the domain description versus uh, specification. The requirements. Requirements. The requirements prescription, yes. So, in chapter six, I think it is, I informally, not formally, and I'll come to that, show how to break down the process of analyzing a domain description and then by projection, instantiation, ex determination, extension, and fitting, produce a domain requirements. Then considering the things that must consist, exist both in the machine for which the software is to be developed and in the domain, I consider the interface requirements of which derived requirements are one and there are others. Now, so there, there is a relation, I claim, between the uh, domain description and the requirements prescription. And that relation is, I, I take care of, in, I have responded to, because you, you asked that question. There was an, in your assessment, very correctly so, uh, that is, it is observed, that there is no formalization of these domain description to requirements prescription transitions. The ones I mentioned, projection, instantiation, determination, and so on. And the answer is basically uh, that I focus on the method study within computing science rather than on the foundation of theory study within computer science. Now, I need to explain those words. So, com method, I hinted at earlier, is a, is a collection of principles for selecting and applying techniques and tools in order to construct something. A formal method, blah, blah, blah. Uh, computing science is the study 
let me start with computer science, sorry, is the study of the phenomena that can exist inside computing devices, uh, most predominantly uh, illustrated by, a th uh, or labeled also by a theoretical computer science, an absolutely necessary prerequisite uh, for ev every software engineer to have learned many of the basic aspects there, algebraic semantics, proof theory, and so on and so forth, complexity theory, and so on. Computing science is now the study and knowledge about how to construct those things. So whenever in my method study in computing science, I come up with some principle, some technique, some tool, I really, and that is your objection, the assessment, correct, I really ought to also have provided a necessary formalization of that. Now, I don't do that. Formalization of the domain would basically account to somewhat, and here I'm a little bit sarcastic, perhaps, trivial algebraic statements that had to do with notions of conservative extension and so on and so forth. And for the audience in this room, uh, I have to say that if you want answers of that kind, there's only one book you need to go to, and it's written by Don Sanella and the man you see on the screen there. And it is, a, it is the seminar work in this area. And, and if, had I had PhD students at the time, uh, first of all, it would have been very easy for me to ask them to read uh, your books, because that's all my former PhD students ever were interested in, were the algebraic semantics and so on. Uh, secondly, they could have helped me in this area, but I'm not formalizing that. So, yes, from an engineering point of view, from a methodology point of view, there is a distinction illustrated by these operators, meta-operators on domain descriptions, projection, instantiation, and so on. And as I perhaps a little bit too uh, quipped say here, namely, and they amount to notions like conservative extension and so on, but that of course has to be shown. I think I'm getting close to an answer. I hope. You still have... You, I think now it's okay. Now, right. now you're you fine. Hear me now. I can right. hear you. Uh, okay, so let me, let me add that of course I don't expect any kind of a formal description of some transition from the domain description yeah. to, uh, to, to the requirement specification. Uh, what I had in mind, and also in this remark, which is the, in, the, in, the, in the report earlier, uh, we said earlier, uh, is that after all, in the end, the domain description is going to be some specific object, yeah. in a sense it's going to be a text, written in some notation at least. Uh, you seem to adhere to the idea that something like uh, RSL notation would be used over there. At least that's what I gathered from reading the book. Uh, and therefore it's going to be an object which we can study on its own. Uh, we should know what things expressed in this notation mean, what kind of ma manipulation we have what kind of manipulations on these descriptions we have available. And these examples you have mentioned from chapter 5, uh, I, I must admit I always have to re resort to the notes to list all these names like instantiation, uh, uh, what else is there? Oh, good Lord, sorry. I've missed somewhere in these notes. So, so all these operations you have mentioned already, uh, which change the domain description in some way and reaching it uh, in either conservative or non-conservative way in some, in some ways, I think this can be a subject of the study itself. And as certainly uh, I believe, because I believe that this is uh, always the need uh, uh, whenever we study any complex phenomena, is that, for example, the issues of the structure of the domain description uh, may come up. 
the issues of how to compose different domain descriptions. Suppose that you concentrate on the uh, domain of vehicles in sense of the technical uh, arrangement of well, how they work or how they uh, are, how they are built on one hand, and on, on the other hand, the transportation system, the beautiful example you have over there, and you have described them se separately in a way, and then you are putting them together with some links between uh, things like that. So these would be operations on domain descriptions, and my question is, to what extent you think did they can be Mm, yeah, formalized and studied on the own. Okay, definitely, yes. So let's go back. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, good. So on one hand, I give in 11 different reports large examples, all written in some pseudo or almost RSL-like notation. Uh, that is not I'm not saying that that should be my description language. I'm saying several places I could use uh, Maud, perhaps I could use Cafe OBJ, I could use uh, at right specification languages, I could use the B method perhaps, Z, VDM, many. Uh, but so far, so let's say I could give that. So what have I done? I've only given you the semantics of the terms that are used by workers in that domain. When they speak to each other, they use terms, and those I've given semantics to. That is not to say that RSL is a domain description language. For that there, there would be for banking, for the financial service industry, there would be, I suggest, a domain specification language whose uh, keywords were keywords of the, the financial service industry. An account. Account would be a keyword, not a variable. It would be a keyword. And the operations on account would be defined over in the other my domain description. So that would be a domain description language for a particular. There is a wonderful such example made of a domain specific language and, and I hate myself for having forgotten. It is developed by an actuarian uh, company in Denmark and, and it gives uh, in the language has the notions that you use when you calculate a premia on, on the loans and risks and so on. So there is a domain specific and it has been given the beautiful semantics and it, all, all these things works. That's one aspect of my first part of my two part answer. Okay, there's the language in which I've given the semantics uh, uh, second uh, is the domain specific language. Now, um, in that sense, uh, yes, there would be definitely be uh, both theories and, and therefore also tool support for making the transition from domain descriptions to requirements, prescriptions, and later on to the others. Uh, not mechanically, not automatically. It's the whole purpose of, of writing down requirements uh, is to take, uh, uh, to sift out those things that uh, are desirable to be computed from those that either cannot be computed or are not desired and specify those. And the purpose of an implementation software design is to do so efficiently to get efficient. And for all those, for the latter part, we know many such tools. Now there's one little remark, which I now almost for forgot. Uh, so I'll come, uh, it'll come up to me in a little while and then I'll uh, put it in, in a subsequent answer to you. Okay, what's that? Well, thanks for, for especially thank you for, for 
for, for talking about these uh, domain-specific domain description formalisms. That's one of the notes which I had uh, aside, and I, I can see that we are thinking in exactly the same direction here. Um, one thought which you haven't mentioned, which can perhaps be useful here, is that you can actually have a kind of a, a hierarchy yeah. of both, on one hand, the domains you describe, as well as the formalisms or notations used yeah. for the description. Good. This example of the account as a keyword yeah. used in the banking system, well, I mean, if you dig deep enough, then the account itself yeah. would have to be explained for someone who is not a banker. So, so th there will be something underneath, right, perhaps, right. and that's an idea which I think is worth exploring. And I wish you had many, many more still young PhD students who would uh, undertake this work, if not but now uh, I, your work. Now, this, now so. I can't. Yes, and that exactly points back to the to the uh, open uh, to the uh, last answer, Name, namely no. Uh, you will observe, uh, my colleagues here from the Institute will have observed that I am uh, very thin. Uh, I'm skimpy on using structure-giving mechanisms like classes and objects and schemes, uh, the kind of things that are very important to do exactly what you are uh, searching for, namely to lend structure to large, uh, to large specifications where... Uh, so I invite my students that I don't have to do that for me and make their thesis on that because it's very much needed. And of course, uh, I remember in, in the later phase of yours and Sanella's writings, how you actually moved into requirements and how you had these architectural models and mechanisms for handling that. I have nothing, not, none of that. Uh, yes, uh, Dines, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to move to, to, to explicitly to chapter three now, uh, where, to my reading, what is really happening is some kind of a technical development of sort of type system for that uh, domain descriptions uh, with which you want to work. I have a number of small technical points which I omit. I would like to run, to start with a, with a really technical point. Uh, and I would like to, to, to ask you, why do you actually prevent recursion in uh, sort definitions or in type definitions? Uh, early on in one Argument at at, uh, at one of the earlier in uh, at one of the earliest parts of the of the of the mono, of the of the thesis, you say that uh, there is nothing like there is no need or you've never account, encountered a need for uh, recursive sort definitions, and the footnote there says, well, look at the trees, which many would claim a natural example of the recursively defined data type or recursively defi defined sort. Uh, and you can discharge this by saying, well, these trees are just kind of graphs and therefore uh, you can get away with this. This is true. And, and this is indeed uh, the fact that you can do this at the semantic level. Now, what I cannot see, uh, and I'm not sure whether can, this can be done at all. And if, even if it can be done, whether this would be a natural solution, how you can define the type of the trees without referring to the recursion at the level of types. So in a way, two questions. Can you, do you think you can do this? And, and another question is, why not allowing the recursive types in your system? First, uh, no, if I want to talk about such structures as trees, as that you and I see out in the garden. Then I definitely do not need a recursive definition. A tree is not a node with one or more subtrees, with zero one or more subtrees. It's not. 
I model it as a graph for which I give you a sort and for which I give you its elements, its subsorts, namely, and so on. Uh, so, and I have not found that this is the point of my bringing the list of the 11 large scale, and we are talking about 100 pages or so, a domain that I have not found anywhere a need for recursion. And, and this is one of the great things of, of, com, of, of, of recursive function, of function theory, of computability and so on, recursion. Yes, inside the computer, but apparently not outside. So I haven't found a need. Uh, if you find a need, uh, uh, I won't put it in because I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how, how the mathematics will work. But how, how would you define a time function? How would you define how would you define a type for the trees? For the set of trees? I would define it as a as composite consisting of nodes and edges, actually like any mathematical textbook on graph theory does. That's how I would do it. Sort. That's, that's not defining a type. That, that's not defining a so, syntactic, in a way, type. No. It's defining the set of trees as uh, semantic values. Yeah, that's a type for me. All right. A so, type? The only, way, the only way I can see that is that you actually define the type for graphs, which is easy, yeah. and attach to this a logical formula. Exactly. Uh, which uh, which is kind of a not entirely statically type type right. in a, in the in the usual sense of this of the word type, but it can it can be done, but only in this way, I, I think. Anyway, uh, and and so so there is no. Well, I was really asking because there was actually recursion in your definition, and there were recursive definitions of your uh, the meaning of your notation over there. Uh, and I just couldn't see any technical reason why the recursive types could not be put in there either. But uh, uh, okay, I buy the argument you didn't encounter the need in the dozens of uh, examples you were doing with the specification. Now, uh, back to a more general question here. Now, if I understood the contents of the of the of the chapter three correctly. Uh, then the way you proceed there, especially aiming at the semantics of these uh, analysis prompts, of these prompts of, uh, of the kind is a part, is a material, etc., etc., uh, prompts, then you proceed as follows. You start with a bunch of names of sorts you have in your domain, of sorts of entities you have in your domain. For each sort, you define a syntactic, in a way, type. <clears throat> then for each type, you define the set of values of this type. And then when you encounter an entity, you check in your, you look up the set of values attached to some sort in which this entity belongs and say that, uh, to determine whether this uh, uh, entity satisfies some classification prompt, analysis prompt, you look at the sort to which this set was attached and look at the type which was attached to this sort. And if this type says, uh, if the type is a type of a part, then you say, yes, this uh, prompt is a part. I'm sorry. <coughs> then you say, yes, is a part uh, prompt calls for this particular entity. Now, this seems to work, uh, uh, but I wonder whether this last step actually brings some new knowledge, intuition to the domain description which you are producing. Now, why not work in a slightly different order? Uh, start basically classify the entities you deal with by sorts, see what they are semantically, and then try to develop a type so for the sort, which would cover as closely as possible 
the entities which are, or the semantic values, which are the entities of this sort. Sort of turning the other way around, not prescribing the types for the sorts, but rather trying to develop the types for the sorts to capture the sets of values which are really there. Because after all, what we start with is this real domain where the entities simply, how should I say, are. Yes, that question. I wish you had asked that question in April 2014. Hello, when I first gave this talk to you, Oh, in, in my, moment, my memory doesn't reach that far. In Kanazawa, at, at the festivities in connection with Kokichi Futatsuki, you and Teresa were there, Martin Wiersing was there, and uh, I think, uh, no, these, all right. <laughs> because you, you made, I, would you please send me an email with that other approach to doing it, because I, it caught me. R you said, rather than doing it the way I was doing it, why not doing it, for example, such and such? I would like to follow up on that. Okay, sure. I only, but I have a prepared answer for you. Have you read the, my screen here? Uh, I can't see the screen at the moment, no. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have it now. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the, second, uh, call, the second one. After all, to define a type for, say, road links, and that's what you were saying just a few minutes ago, in what I wrote there. Uh, okay. well, I'm happy to send you the, the, whatever I made notes for this, this, no, uh, this no, part of the question. I, and my reply, reply is only that that is indeed the case. Yes, it is right. Uh, after all, it is a model, not a definition. Uh, it's an afterthought, not a premonition. It's a weak answer. It's not a uh, uh, scientifically uh, fulfilling one. But what you may not have uh, uh, observed is that that I, the, uh, the thesis that you have been evaluating is shown here to the left in the figure. And now in, in early 2021, Springer will publish in, in the same prestigious series as your book, um, a, a book where chapter one becomes chapters three, four, five, six, where chapter four has been completely omitted. I don't include it, which is a way of saying I'm not happy with that chapter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, I'm not sure whether it's, it's proper to advertise future books uh, which will come on the market at this kind of event. But, uh, all right, uh, so this off, th there is actually uh, something much deeper here. Uh, which is perhaps of a philosophical nature, so maybe I shouldn't really go into this. Uh, uh, namely, you assume there is this issue of uniqueness of entities. So in a way, uh, also in this way you treat the types and the uh, semantics of the analysis prompts, etc. you kind of assume that the values of the entities as values, as you have them, as you look at them, as you analyze them, they are complete descriptions or they are complete in a way that they are the things and you know everything about them. So in a way, at this uh, presentation, you kind of leave no room for the uh, abstraction, forgetting about some properties of the, of the things which are there. It, it doesn't say that, I, I don't say that, that when you describe the domain, when in the domain description, there will be no abstraction. But actually, the foundational way of thinking, at least that the way I read this, uh, does not allow for the abstraction. I'm not sure whether it's good or bad, or whether there should be something else being done here as well. Yes, indeed. That is a in a sense, a problematic point. 
No, there is no abstraction in the sense that if two entities that I claim, if they are identical, it's because their unique identifier is the same. If I now take the unique identifier away and only consider their meriology and all the attributes, uh, then there might be several entities that have the same value. Now, if I abstraction to me means either a simpler meriology or that I omit uh, one or more of the perhaps 20 or 30 attributes. Now, if I do that, I don't have the same sort of entity any longer. That's, that's exactly true. But this also leads... Sorry. Yeah. And that's exactly true, and that's, that, that was to some extent my point. I mean, after all... And that, yes, leads, that leads... Uh, and I'm not going into that at all in the thesis, but that leads into, I think, very fascinating questions that relate, you could say, to, to uh, Galois connections. Okay? Namely, so, so th I'm not going into abstraction in that sense. Yes. Uh, okay. the, the, the reason I raise this point is that actually that's something completely different uh, from uh, what's happening, say, in the real uh, program, so to speak, where uh, the usual example, you know, the sequence of bits may be either an integer or Boolean and depends on what, how you label it. Uh, you can do different things with it. Right? And, and here you kind of presume that the nature of the thing is all there. And I think it's fine at this level, uh, but we should realize that, 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 at least I think, there should be abstraction mechanisms uh, allowed in the domain description as well, somewhere. Uh, can we move on? Uh, uh, just a brief remark. Yeah. Yes, either it should be in the domain description, or it must at least be introduced in the requirements. Sure. Because that's, if the requirements don't give you abstraction possibilities, then the, the software designer has no choices. And we want him. Okay. I hope not wrong to the discussion and the distinction between, uh, you know, under-specification and non-determinism and things like that. Uh, and and under, uh, that's a different topic. Uh, you have mentioned in, in, in the previous uh, answer, you have mentioned uh, Mariology. I know that it's Leshnevsky's word and I should know how to pronounce it correctly, but uh, never mind. So this, this study of the parthood and, and, and related notions and really this, the study of the structure of the things uh, uh, as, as we view it. Uh, I must admit that, that I liked a lot uh, what you did in this part of the thesis, uh, in particular the bit which extracts a meriology uh, from the domain description, from the, the structure of the types of the sorts, etc., etc. Uh, now. Uh, and also it's, it's, it's uh, one nice place where there is something like a mathematical theorem over there, which says that, 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 that this meteorology extracted from the domain description does satisfy the um, axioms of meteorology as put to, and studied, uh, as studied by the logicians. Uh, that's nice. Uh, a natural question for me, which you do not mention even in the thesis, is whether this, is, this procedure of getting meteorologies is somehow complete. That is, whether every meriology or every model which satisfies the axioms logicians gave may be obtained in this way. This seems to be an abstract theoretical question, but that's actually a thing which has practical consequences because put it the other way around, is that there is a question whether when we want to argue about meriologies prescribed by the domain descriptions, uh, whether there is a room or potential room for further properties than those given by the axioms as you studied them. 
And uh, my feeling is, and of course I didn't, I didn't try to prove this in any way, that, that these uh, mariologies which arise from the domain descriptions are general enough that they actually cover everything. So there is no room and there is some kind of a completeness in this procedure. I'm not sure if you looked at this at all or thought about it. No, but it's, 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 it is a relevant question then. Open. If I was to, you know, if I was to put a student of mine on this, then I would tell him prove that it is the case, and it shouldn't be very, very difficult. But uh, have a look at this. Then another thing we should do with meteorology uh, in the in the thesis, just next to this uh, to this uh, discussion of the logics, uh, is that you produce a system or a set of uh, CSP processes which kind of mimic this uh, meteorology you start with, right? And now what was in a way quite disappointing for me is that uh, you actually don't do anything with this anymore. Yeah. You just show that it is. There is not even a formal statement in which sense the set of uh, CSP processes uh, models the meteorology for of the domain description you you, you start with. Uh, this could be easily stated formally, I think, and, and and I think it's worthwhile exercise to actually do this. But even more so, there is no discussion, uh, which I would like to see, of a potential further application of this structure uh, of the of the CSP processes for the requirements development for the system development further on. Like, for example, one, one would think that these processes somehow are you maybe used as a basis for them modeling the actual behavior in the requirement specification uh, as you discuss later on in the thesis. So I, I admit I miss this a lot. I'm not sure again whether you thought along these lines at all or you just an exercise to be put aside. Certainly, I have, thank you. Now, what is the what is the name? What is the title of that chapter? Uh, what is the title of chapter? Uh, uh, we are talking about uh, about uh, section five point five. No, no, yeah. No, the, the the chapter where I deal with meteorology. Uh, uh, chapter five. Yeah, uh, so that's that's the chapter four. four chapter four. Oh, good Lord. What uh, is the name of that chapter? I don't think I'm able to find it. Is uh, yeah. So that's section uh, section four point seven. A semantic CSP model of Mariology, where you develop. Yeah, but the chapter, the chapter. It, chapter four. What is the chapter? What is it called? Title chapter four. Uh, I remember exactly the title. It's true. Uh, Every manifest to make Mariology a CSP okay. expression. The chapter Every manifest to make Mariology a CSP expression. That's uh, that's the title of chapter four. And that's the answer. And in, in that's this section, the uh, question, which I just mentioned, four point something, you present a set of CSP models for a Mariology, uh, and my critique, apologies. Uh, is that there is no formal statement in which sense this set of CSP processes, I don't know, models, relates, captures this meteorology. And the other part of, okay. of my question is how useful this developed set of processes is, or rather how can it be used? Yeah. So I try to answer that. And you see it on the screen. Uh, no, I can't unless someone sweeps so. Okay. Can you make sure that he sees the screen? Yes, I can see the screen. However, the thesis stops short of claiming what really has been achieved in this way. In what precise sense the CSP processes capture the meteorology? That's in your assessment and it's similar. And my answer to that, the CSP processes capture the meteorology inherent in the part structure in communicating with exactly the processes it is meteorologically related to. That's half the answer. The other half, the, the first part was the title of the chapter is that statement. It would have been nice if I could have made 
the reverse statement to every uh, FDR uh, pro failure divergence uh, refinement uh, set of CSP processes, there is a methodology. I cannot do that. I can easily see examples where, I can, where it wouldn't work. Concerning the first part of the answer, yeah, I mean, I understand that uh, what what you what you wrote here, uh, and I can envisage how to state this formally. All I am saying is that has this has not been formally stated right. as such in the thesis. Uh, for example, this notion of uh, of what does it actually you know. The way I would have done this is that given a set of, RB, uh, of CSP processes with some communications, then I would have defined what kind of a meteorology is defined there and simply claim that meteorology for the set of processes you developed is the same you started with uh, in the domain description. But as I said, this is a technicality, it's just a matter of statement. No, I think it's much more interesting and promising for the future is to study to what extent this developed set of uh, processes maybe the skeleton right. for further work in the, yeah. the development of uh, requirements. And yes, I do realize that it is outside the scope of this particular thesis, but I just think that no, it's an no, interesting right. direction so, to proceed and, and, and have a look at. Which is maybe it will work, maybe not, I don't know. Which is why in the assessment report you, you basically question why CSP as a target, namely uh, uh, then is there any other purpose to develop such CSP processes? Basically, no, but it's not only enough, but rather telling that can be done. Question, can they be used as a basis for development of derived perdurance? Which is a wonderful uh, question. Uh, so I don't, uh, the thesis uh, completely abstains from looking at possible calculi for developing the finer aspects of perdurance. Uh, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, as I said, that's what I found no, but interesting I, and in a way exciting about the thesis, that there are so many things you can we, we, actually still work on. Uh, I think we talked a bit. Uh, the, 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 the next question of mine, which in my notes concerned these uh, transformations on the domain description, this projection, instantiation, determination, extension, and fitting. Uh, they were presented by means of examples, and uh, I surely understand the idea behind each of those. Uh, what I, as I was saying earlier, what I would love to see is some kind of a uh, transformations of that kind being described in a more precise yeah. words and, and being studied as the subject of study uh, on their own. Things like, you know, uh, that uh, what uh, instantiation preserve the properties which we had, etc., etc. Uh, claims like that, I think, are needed if these are going to be used in practice. And as you said, they are even more needed if they are to be basis for the you know, some kind of a tool support for the development and transformation and, and, and writing out uh, of domain descriptions and then for the process of getting from domain descriptions to, to, to specification, well, to requirement specification. So uh, yeah. I just would like to see this and I gather from what you are saying that you haven't really worked on this so far, but that's yet another place where some students would be useful. Yeah. So can you see the screen? Yes. So I address your concern there, which is my concern too. I can only agree with you uh, in the 2008 paper for Ugo Montanari's first shrift. Uh, I actually have a four line paragraph, uh, three lines in text and one in, in formula uh, that hints at what you're asking for, that hints at the kind of property that must be preserved or is now in, 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 in superimposed or whatever. But uh, 
since I never developed that, I didn't include it in the, in, in, in the thesis here. It should be done. Uh, I agree with you there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just don't quite believe that the conservativity of the, of the extensions would be the only thing to say here. I think that there, no. is, there should be more, considerably no, more. No, uh, uh, the con uh, uh, Dines, thank you for, 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 for this chat. Uh, I, I would like to add one, uh, I guess, more a remark than, than, than a question, really, concerning the chapter 6, this development of ideas and suggestions. I, I, I very warmly think of what you wrote there uh, about the fact that uh, quite a few of us have been uh, often exposed uh, to and sometimes even had to uh, endure uh, boring presentations and demos of systems, even if the systems were of interest uh, themselves. Uh, so. To be honest, I am wondering whether we didn't, uh, I don't feel bored, I believe you don't either, but maybe we bored the audience a little bit too much, so maybe we should use this recipe and, and stop at this point. Uh, that's all from me, Dines. Congratulations on, on the thesis, which, as you would have seen, was of interest to me and certainly uh, stimulated a number of thoughts in very many directions. Thank hey, you. Can I follow up? Uh, can, can you see the screen? Yes. In your report, uh, it says demos, simulators, monitors, and controllers addresses one potential application of domain descriptions, etc. To which I must say, no, rather, it addresses all potential uh, discrete dynamics uh, human intervention domains. The proof is, of course, in the pudding, in, 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 in the list of... You have here a list. It applies to all those. That's not one application. That's quite a few applications. So, thank you. <laughs> That's quite a few applications. You all appreciate that, but as a mathematician, I hesitate to use a big universal quantifier of the things I cannot really quantify. Exactly. So. Yeah, thank you. Can I add a little historical point? Of course, Dines. Please go ahead. Uh, Peter Johansson, you spent uh, a year at MIT. What was the name of your host? What was his name? Douglas Ross. Doug, Douglas Royd. Douglas Royd, thank you. Royd. Douglas Royd and Tony Hall were both members of the IFIP Working Group 2.3 for the almost 30 years I was a member of it. And Doug Roy would stand up and get, basically give the same talk every time. Uh, People who raised topics for discussion uh, would vote on the first day whether to listen to Doc Roy or not, and he was always listened to, uh, and uh, half the members would sort of sneak out of the room or, or not be there. Uh, and I was fascinated. I didn't understand much of it. till much, much later, when I came across this Meriology uh, through some Italian philosophers and their books, uh, and I discovered that that was what he talked about, and he always talked about it with due reference to Lesniewski and so on and so forth. In the same room, uh, in the mid-70s, uh, Tony Hall, presented his earliest ideas on CSP. Uh, and you could ask, what, what is the connection between these two things? Uh, in 2009, for Tony Hall's uh, 65th, 2009, for his 75th or something birthday at Cambridge, uh, I gave uh, the first uh, talk which linked uh, meteorology to CSP in the sense that you have seen it in the thesis here. 
So history uh, and what we have experienced over the years does play a role. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Professor Teleski. Thank you. So I've not been notified of any questions ex auditorio, and that means that we are uh, at the end of the defense pro proceedings. And uh, I'd like, first of all, uh, to thank the doctoral candidate and, of course, the assessment committee, Professor Blackburn, Professor Teleski, and Professor Nelson, for their uh, efforts. And I'll just... Uh, before formally ending the defense, say a little bit about what is uh, going uh, to happen now. So uh, immediately after I close the defense, the, the committee will uh, convene, convene and uh, complete their uh, recommendations to the academic councils, to the academic council on whether uh, the title Dr. Technicist should be conferred upon Dean Espiona. And uh, the academic council will then meet on February 22nd uh, to take uh, the final decision. Now, it, if it is a unanimous uh, recommendation from the opponents, then uh, uh, the approval of the Academic Council is automatic. And if that is the case, uh, then uh, on uh, April 23rd at the annual commemoration party, uh, the president of the university will pr present uh, Dean Espiano with uh, the doctoral letter. But until then, uh, we can con congratulate you, not on the degree, but on completing uh, the uh, defense. And uh, I have a bouquet of flowers uh, here uh, that I will present to you. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I propose uh, a round of applause uh, uh, to end uh, the session here. And then you're all invited uh, to a, a small reception. Two left corners going out of the door, two left turns going out of the door, straight ahead into the faculty club. And there'll be uh, a glass and a, and a small snack. So please join us uh, in there. Hi, bye.